Okay, why don't, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Skinner, um, and hope you had a good lunch break. This is, is this, this is the ParLab boot camp, right? Okay, good. I, sometimes the names change of, of uh, what's what. So we have, you know, uh, a pretty small audience here. I hope you, um, you know, feel comfortable asking. Um, this is a, is a hopefully very accessible sort of talk about uh, performance debugging, uh, so trying to get good performance from codes. Uh, I run a software group at Lawrence Berkeley Lab as part of the, uh, the computing center there called NERSC, the National Energy Research uh, Scientific Computing Center. Has anybody here uh, heard of NERSC or run at NERSC before? Oh, okay, good. So this, this will hopefully be useful to you. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, I hope to convey to you some principles about uh, getting good performance from codes, uh, some, some techniques uh, of the practice, and uh, have tried to direct these to the following sort of, you know, uh, CS267 type uh, simulation scientist, somebody who uh, is an application developer. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're more into compilers and middleware and, you know, sort of the, the meta version of that, um, it'll be less applicable. Uh, I'm a chemist uh, by training and came into computing through, uh, you know, this uh, simulation science avenue. And so that, that influences a lot of my perspectives on this. So just real quickly, one slide about NERSC is that we're a Department of Energy Office of Science shop. Um, we look a lot like uh, a university. Uh, we have, you know, geophysics, astrophysics, chemistry, everything in between. Uh, across a, a lot of users and a lot of projects. So um, what that means is that, that we have some breadth when it comes to what performance means. Um, you know, it's not uh, a simple benchmark that defines performance and then you're done. Um, we, uh, we try to, uh, every, anybody who runs a computer has to make architectural selections. And uh, what you'll hear me talk about are, uh, are machines that are really driven by scientific workloads. So we could do more interesting, uh, you know, in terms of adventure, uh, architectural forays. But um, you know, most of, of what we uh, what we deploy really has to work for thousands of users, hundreds of codes, uh, that sort of thing. So it's you know x86 at least currently, uh, not not uh, so focused on accelerators, uh, high concurrency, large scale uh, sort of environment. And uh, who here has heard of Edison? Anybody? So if you can get access to Edison, it's an amazing machine. It's really, really, uh, uh, if, if you like Topper, you'll like Edison uh, even more. It's got some, in particular, memory bandwidth um, characteristics that are just phenomenal. So let's back out a little bit and kind of get a big picture of what uh, performance and scalability really mean. Um, you know, when you run a program, different things can happen. And you could get no output, you could get the wrong output, uh, or you could get something in that kind of performance category where, uh, you know, you, you get output, it's probably the right output, um, but maybe you're not getting it at the rate that you expect or otherwise there's some other sort of issue there. And uh, I encourage people to think very broadly ab about what performance is. You know, it's not, um, it's not like a class where you get an ABC, you know, sort of grade. Uh, you can get a megaflop rating or a gigaflop or a you know petaflop rating for a code, uh, and that's that can be a useful number, but it's 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 one number, and and you know performance is sort of a, a lot bigger than that. So uh, when you're when you're running at scale, uh, performance can take on a really different sort of uh, set of ramifications. And the example that that uh, that I thought I'd you know try to broaden your thinking through is this uh, the night trading company. Uh, uh, about a year ago, uh, lost $400 million in 30 minutes uh, due to a, a software error uh, and big, fast computers. So uh, what does this have to do with HPC? Well, you know, if you're, if you're running a program on your laptop and it's not running fast enough, you might kind of, you know, go like this and wish that it was done and, and that sort of thing. If you're running on, you know, 100,000 cores, and there's a performance glitch, it looks a lot more like this situation because the, the amount of resource, the, the consequence of performance loss is magnified at scale. And, uh, and that's, that's an important thing to, to think about. Um, and, you know, 
if you're using a, a synchronizing high concurrency algorithm, the, the simplest algorithms really for people to write uh, are, are those that are bulk synchronous. They, they move data sort of in data movement stages. They, uh, they synchronize to get everything you know, across uh, processors in the same space. Um, if there is a barrier, a globally synchronizing event, then the, the consequence of that barrier, you know, if there's a performance glitch, that is if there's one slow task to the barrier, uh, goes up tremendously with concurrency. And we'll, we'll see some examples of that. If you have questions along the way, let me know. So this is uh, uh, some performance information from uh, one code uh, run across concurrencies and architectures. So the, this slide is, is uh, you know, talking about what are the dimensions to performance? What are the, if you were to uh, do the calculus of performance, you know, what are the independent variables sort of that you can vary? Well, you know, performance certainly depends on the code, uh, what, you, what you tell the code to do or the input deck where you run it, how many cores you run it on, uh, what else is running on the machine at that time. Maybe, maybe not, you know. Uh, and, you know, even the person. So, you know, the, uh, give two people, you know, the same assignment to run a code and see what numbers they come out with. It's, you know, how you compile your environment variables, you know, how you submit the thing. There are a lot of factors that can come into performance. So, uh, you know, concurrency and architecture are two of the, the more clear-cut, uh, grounded sort of uh, elements to that. And this shows one code, same input deck, uh, you know, same person, in fact, I think they ran all these, but on four different supercomputer architectures uh, at four different concurrencies. And the, the color is where you spend your time. Uh, and, you know, you might think, well, I'd like to spend a lot of time calculating because that's, that's where progress happens in, in a code. Um, that's the blue. The red is the amount of time spent in MPI communicating, and the green is the amount of time spent in I.O. So um, if there's one takeaway from this, it's that, you know, performance is context dependent. And that if, uh, you know, uh, one, one place I'm sure you'll, con you'll I, I still hear it amongst computer, si you know, computer uh, simulation folks is people say, that code performs well. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it does. Maybe that code has a track record of performing well. You know, take it to a different architecture, take it to a different concurrency. And the factors that bottleneck performance could be very, very different. It could be the disk instead of the interconnect and that sort of thing. So um, the, uh, the names have been changed to protect the innocent here, but, you know, it, it says across these four supercomputers, um, you know, different choices were made about wh what the architecture is good at. And um, so architecture matters and concurrency matters. If you double the number of cores that you run a, a code at, uh, don't be surprised if, if you don't double the performance, at least not right away. Uh, performance is also relative to, to your goals in terms of what you want to get done. So uh, time to solution can include, you know, the time spent waiting in a queue uh, as a, uh, in addition to the time spent uh, actually executing the code. You know, if you're, if you're interested in sort of the application and architecture interaction, maybe this is less relevant because what you want is a kind of a pristine benchmark about, uh, about how the code runs. But if you're, you know, trying to make a... Uh, uh, simulation code for your PhD thesis or something like that, well, the amount of time that you spent writing the code, first of all, uh, and the amount of time that you spent waiting for it to execute and, uh, and watching it execute all come together. Uh, so, you know, find ways to, to use the computer as the most useful tool that you can as opposed to thinking that the computer needs to be run in, in one particular way. Oh, I guess there's one other point there. Um, so one, uh, one way to, to look at this is, is focus on specific use cases about what you want to get done as opposed to making everything perform well. And when, when I was a, a grad student in the College of Chemistry back in 96, um, you know, I had a code that I wanted to make run fast, and I heard that BLOSS was fast. And so I thought, everywhere there's a vector thing in this code, I'm going to go through and put in BLOSS. And you know, I did make the code faster, but I found that you know, I changed, you know, 70 loops into BLOSS functions when, in fact, two of them were, were where the performance is. So uh, try, to, try to use that sort of specificity to, to uh, make your work productive. There are lots of numbers in performance, and we'll see some of those numbers uh, later in this talk. This is kind of a, a flow chart, so you can, uh, you know, later in the talk, kind of zoom in on the parts that are relevant to you. Um, you know, formulating a research problem, coding it up, uh, getting the thing to run right, that is debugging it. And I won't talk a lot about debugging programs. We're talking about really performance debugging. 
uh, running lots of jobs, having them wait in the queue, do they produce data, do you need to do uncertainty quantification or validation verification on that, on that data, and then how do you understand the data and publish it? So you could put a time, you could put a variety of performance numbers to any of the steps in here, and uh, so performance is a lot more than a single number. So plan where you put that effort. Um, you know, uh, put, uh, I, I, uh, I'm not above printf myself. We'll talk about a lot of tools in this talk that are well beyond printf, but I, I like it. And, you know, if you, if you have printfs or the, the analogy thereof, you know, in these steps, then you can kind of look at, well, how much time do I uh, actually spend dealing with the data, you know, and, and is maybe that the, the type of performance that I want to optimize for? Or dealing with jobs. There, there's a whole, you know, cottage... Uh, role for, for graduate students out there that it's basically, you know, herding jobs through the queue, you know, and maybe, maybe the, the way to get better performance is to, you know, write a, a Python script that helps uh, herd those things through the queue. So get, diving in a, a little more into uh, to HPC uh, and kind of the more standard sort of performance directions, you know, we can definitely uh, lay out a taxonomy of performance issues that are serial versus parallel. Um, you know, getting as much out of the processor you can per uh, cycle, you know, per instruction is, is really important. Um, in Jim's talk that was before this, he was looking at, you know, how you, uh, through padding, uh, cache blocking, a lot of other techniques like that, can really keep those pipelines fed. And, uh, you know, unfortunately uh, for, for you, I, I think, you know, most of, uh, most of the people in the room, some of those pipelines are, are kind of getting kind of complicated now, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what multi-core has done to memory bandwidth and things like that. So, um, you know, being able to dive in and understand uh, what what prefetch is is doing, you know, and uh, and other things like that is important. Uh, data locality uh, very important, increasingly so with today's memory architectures. And in the parallel space, you know, finding ways to expose concurrency. Processor does a lot, you know, on its own to, to help you use the functional units that are, that are on the core. Uh, much less so, in fact, rarely so, when it comes to parallel computing across nodes. It's going to be on you to come up with a, a scheme, by and large, to expose concurrency, uh, to understand when, when is it worth sending a message. You know, there's a cost to send a message, which is the latency. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're... Uh, bound by latency effects, you'll probably make less progress overall. Performance is, is also hierarchical in this sort of sense. Um, that you have registers that sort of, this is from fast at the top to, to slower at the bottom. Um, and where your code spends time uh, uh, will determine what sort of performance optimization techniques make sense to your, to your code. And, you know, one way to look at it is that try to move as, as high up in this as you can. And, um, uh, you know, nobody would probably, you know, in most cases look at just the registers, but uh, within caches there are certainly uh, entire codes which can be cache resident. And if, if you can do that, if you can fit within that place in the hierarchy, then um, the set of things that you need to worry about is much more limited. Typically the performance will be a lot higher. Um, the moment, really, uh, that, that you can't fit in cache, then dealing with local memory and its, its penalties for latency and bandwidth become important, and so on to remote uh, memory through messages and, and out to disk and things like that. But at whichever layer the, uh, the performance bottleneck has been identified, that's, that's a, a good point in the hierarchy to put, put in effort. So the Berkeley way I summarize this is think globally, compute locally. And on to the, uh, the specific tools that you'll find if you log in to, uh, to a machine like Hopper. They, they fit in this hierarchy as well, and uh, I've laid out a few of them here. Um, who here has heard of Pappy before, the uh, performance API? Okay, it's, it's a, it's a low-level but uh, highly accessible set of tools. It's, you could think of it as a library that knows how to interrogate counters on the chip. And why is that important? If you look at the, you know, the, the detailed manual for almost any uh, computer chip nowadays, these counters are not designed to be uh, uh, you know, uh, easy to use. You know, they're, they're designed to uh, run tests on the, the chip in the factory and things like that. So 
the the a set of very uh, you know dedicated people have produced this thing called Pappy that uh, is expressed in terms of performance questions and the sorts of things that an application person would really want to know. And it takes care of all the yuck uh, underneath about what is that specific register, how many of those registers can I read at once, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Valgrind is a command line tool that will can tell you a lot about uh, memory access, memory leaks, uh, whole, you know, it's, a, it's really a Swiss army knife uh, for a, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of local memory types of things. Um, and it, it, it gets, you know, above the, the thread or process level into, uh, you know, into really where the runtime happens, uh, uh, more detailed interaction with the operating system, for instance. Um, there's the name shifted MPI interface, PMPI, uh, which is uh, really the, the it, it is to, uh, uh, it's, it's the pappy of messages, is one way to, to look at it. It's, it's the thing that lets you figure out how much time did I spend in that broadcast or um, which of my sends uh, are taking a long time to, to complete and that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, at the, the disk and file system level, there's things like SAR and LMT. Uh, and then you have, um, is there a laser pointer? No. Um, you have other tools like Cray and IPM and Tau that are listed out there. These are, these are tools that essentially aggregate uh, well-known performance uh, sor sources of performance data into into a higher level thing. So uh, minimally, they'll provide you with a report. Uh, so rather than run an individual tool at an individual level, you get sort of an aggregate report from the whole thing. How do they work? Um, mostly through you know just a, a, a very small number of ways. Either sampling, which is that your program gets interrupted every once in a while, either by an overflow or based on time or, or something like that. You build up a statistical profile. Um, tracing and instrumentation are also possible. You insert hooks into the program that, rather than sample, are procedurally driven. You know, every time you reach a certain point in the program, something happens. Uh, and they, they often use har hardware event counters, uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, you know, unless you're really, really interested in the details of one particular chip, um, you know, it, it, I would advise to think about performance debugging at, at a higher level through uh, a mechanism that provides you access to those performance counters. What are you uh, looking for in a tool, uh, or what, what's the tool going to ask you to do? Um, you know, it may ask you to modify your code uh, to insert macros, API calls, timers. Certainly, in, in a lot of cases, like ho Hopper, uh, you know, a lot of big machines, you're going to have to recompile, probably. Um, uh, you know there are LD preload and other sort of uh, mechanisms that we can that some of the tools will will work on, but uh, more and more with static executables on large machines, uh, recompiling your code will be part of it. Uh, you you may take a binary and transform it with a tool, so binary rewriting uh, is used by some tools, um, and then interpreting the results may happen within the tool. It may happen. Uh, that you get a, a file that's written out, and uh, and then you use that file, uh, use a different program on that file. Like, has anybody here used prof or gprof? Yeah. Okay. So that that's an example of that, where you you do something special, you run the code as you normally would, and you're left with a performance artifact, and then you can go and in, uh, introspect that artifact. So uh, the types of tools that you'll find at, at NERSC, uh, Craypat, uh, we're uh, mostly uh, Cray, uh, you know, have Cray machines uh, currently, so so a lot of our tool infrastructure is oriented around that. Uh, Tau is one of the most uh, robust and wide-ranging uh, tool infrastructures that's out there. Uh, Pappy does have bare-bones tools itself. Uh, if you want to get the flop count from a code, you can do that with Pappy pretty uh, pretty simply. Gprof will give you hotlines, things like that. Where where am I spending time in my code? Uh, and uh, myself and some other people at, uh, at NERSC have written something called Integrated Performance Monitoring that I'll talk about a little bit too. And these are the, the types of uh, you know, things that you might expect to learn from, from a tool. Uh, flop rate, uh, memory high watermark, uh, you know, what, what are threads doing, what are messages doing, uh, these, these sorts of things. And I, I, would, I would add that I, I'll probably use the term later a scaling study. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes in a scaling study, what you're looking at is one of these metrics here as a function of concurrency. 
So as I add more parallelism, um, how do these numbers change? There is no right tool overall. Dive in, uh, you know, find the one that works for you. Um, uh, you know, some typical scenarios where you might go reaching for, for a tool are a code that's slow. If you want to have a, a really detailed performance assessment, that is that you're, you're about to burn a million hours on a, on a big machine and you want to make sure that you're, you know, not, uh, not throwing, you know, 30% of it on the floor. Um, and then once you're running, um, you know, it's not unusual to have, say, things that change as you, as you go about your 5,000 runs that you're going to do. They're, they're probably not going to be the same thing run 5,000 times over and over again. There'll be different inputs, things like that. So uh, having a, a, a barometer for how the production work, uh, workload goes is, is interesting as well. And if, if you're into, you know, into this topic for studying uh, production workloads, that is sort of the in situ performance situation on any given supercomputer in the world, um, that, that sort of production monitoring is important as well. So let me talk first about Craypat. Um, Craypat is not one tool, it's a, it's a suite, but um, the, uh, the, the core tools are, are definitely the place to start. Um, and it'll do sampling or tracing, um, and it, it goes uh, on a node and off a node as well. Uh, it leaves you with a, a file, which is of itself a, a database that can be introspected in different ways. And if you look at the manuals of this, it's actually pretty open, you know, that there are tools to help you. If those tools don't work, there are other ways to, to extract the information that you want. And it, it, one of the best things it has going for it is it really covers the entire, maybe not the entire, but from my perspective, uh, you know, almost the entire space of uh, of parallel methodologies, many of which are listed here. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that there are new emerging, uh, you know, uh, parallel uh, uh, libraries and languages that, that are not listed, but this is pretty good for a tool. Uh, it's not unusual to find ones that support Fortran and C only. So how do you use it? Um, the, the modules environment uh, provides you with a route to um, uh, do module load perf tools. Uh, you rebuild your, uh, your application. The key thing is that you need all the object files. Uh, what what Craypad is going to do is going to go in and, and instrument those object files and then re reassemble another, uh, uh, another binary that, um, that has uh, all the PAT stuff built into it. And uh, then when you rerun, you'll be left with this, uh, this profile, and you can uh, edit that directly. And it'll provide you with, with these sorts of metrics. Um, so um, this PAT RT uh, HWPC uh, is an integer setting uh, at runtime. You don't, you don't need to recompile to get this. You, you know, it's not unusual that somebody might instrument with CrayPAT and then run four times to across these different things, and run. You know, for performance studies in general, running four times if you can, that's a really good idea. You know, because um, unless you're seeing the same performance scenario over, you know, over and over again, uh, you could be chasing your tail. And the the numbers in the middle are what what Cray has uh, specified as sort of, uh, you know, are are areas to to look at. So if if your L1 cache hit ratio is less than ninety percent that's an area for optimization, uh, or at least to consider. And these are other sort of advisory uh, things. Now, um, this demand depends tremendously on the algorithm, the language, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, a lot of different things. But, you know, it's good to have a, a, a benchmark at least about what, what is starting to look a little bit off overall. On to some, some other tools. Uh, integrated performance monitoring uh, does... Uh, this collection of things, it's looking at communication, computation, and, and I.O. Um, one of the, uh, the nice things about it is that on, uh, on platforms that support shared libraries, you don't need to, uh, to recompile. Just do module load IPM and then run as you, as you normally would. Uh, on, so on Carver or other uh, uh, systems that support dynamic shared libraries, places where you're using Python, for instance, um, you could use IPM. Otherwise, you do have to relink against a, uh, a .a uh, library. And it uses the PMPI interface to intercept uh, MPI calls. You know, it, it, it doesn't work with, um, 
you know, uh, UPC or CUDA or, or other types of uh, tools like that. So when you run with IPM, you'll get a little report that looks like this. And, um, you know, the IPM was, was developed not to be a Swiss Army knife for performance uh, measurements or performance studies, but to really get you this kind of core information. How long did I run? Uh, how much time did I spend communicating? How much memory did I use? That sort of thing. So if you're working on an algorithm and trying to, you know, improve the, the, uh, the surface to volume ratio or uh, your, your code is crashing because it runs out of memory or, or things like that, uh, IPM can give you high watermark on memory and tell you how you're doing communication-wise. It does have a, uh, uh, if you set IPM profile equal full, you can get a lot more information out. These columns of numbers are totals, and the, the first column, average, min, and max. So uh, in the examples that we'll look at, uh, the difference between the min and max and the average can be really an important um, bit of uh, a clue uh, to, to where to look for performance debugging uh, opportunities because uh, most parallel codes that are, that are operating in an ideal or highly optimized way tend to be flat. So flat is good, uh, sort of in the parallel computing space overall. Uh, if, there's, if there's synchronization points and one of, the, uh, one of the tasks or threads deviates significantly from the average or, or from the others, then you can easily reach a situation where the performance imbalance is caused by uh, just really one task. And th there's a lot of other stuff in here about, uh, you know, this is broken down into the type of MPI call. So knowing that you have kind of too much communication in your code overall is useful, even more useful to know that it's in MPI send, uh, for instance. So this is a, uh, a pie chart of uh, communication time per MPI call, which says that gather V and scatter V, that is red and green, are the, the dominant communication uh, you know, bottlenecks here. Um, it can also tell you what your pairwise communication topology is. So. Um, this is, is uh, you know, useful to, to look at for two reasons. One is, is it, can rep it can give you a representation of what your communication algorithm or strategy is. Um, if you stare at this long enough, uh, this, you know, is a 36-way code, so pretty small. But you can see it's, it's, a, it's a stencil, uh, you know, three-dimensional stencil. Uh, everybody communicates with the neighbor the left, right, up, down, uh, all six directions. Um, and it's colored by the, uh, the intensity of communication. So uh, if in the kind of unusual circumstance you have not just a timing difference that's causing a uh, performance bottleneck, but you have a, uh, a volume uh, discontinuity, that is that one task is penalized by having to actually communicate more data uh, than other tasks, then that's, uh, then that's worth showing up. This particular example doesn't have any of those, uh, those examples uh, present in it. So you, so you don't see different coloration in it so much. Kind of a, the highest level thing that MPI can do for you in the communication space is, are these uh, cumulative distributions. And so, again, color is just which, which function, which MPI call. And uh, what this gets across is, what are the important buffer sizes? You know, uh, you know if, if you're lucky enough to have a code that communicates using one or two or three buffer sizes only, then that's great. Uh, but if, if you don't have that, that the amount of uh, data communicated varies, uh, you know, as, as the code runs or from task to task, then a really important question is, what size messages should I pay attention to? And that comes out fairly well here because on the, on the y-axis you have percentage of time spent communicating at that buffer size or less, right? So wherever it picks up, that's the, that's the buffer size that's driving the time up. Um, and so... You know, this says that at uh, 64 or closer to 128 kilobytes, the MPI scatter V, you know, kind of goes from the, through the roof. It goes from 10% of that time to nearly 100% of that time. And um, so that, again, doesn't tell you what line number in my code do I go modify, but it does tell you what type of messaging is, is, uh, bottleneck, uh, is a bottleneck to performance. Okay, so that's, that's about it for IPM. I wanted to um, 
give a, uh, a cautionary tale here about uh, tracing. So when it comes to performance debugging, the, the you know, gold standard, I guess, you know, uh, although I'm, I'm not that big of an enthusiast of it overall, is to trace it. That is, that if you want to know what's going on, write down everything, right? And then you know what task did what when. And if you dump all that out, you can replay it and you can analyze it. Um, now, that has certain uh, problems. And, you know, one is that if you're running on 100,000 tasks, you could be talking about, you know, terabytes of data that, that you're writing out. So data management is one. Um, as the volume of data grows larger and larger, um, the likelihood that you're actually perturbing the algorithm that you're trying to measure goes up as well. And so uh, there, are, there are plenty of people out there who think, you know, if I want to understand the performance of my code, I'm going to trace it. And then I'll have everything, I'll understand it, you know, uh, just right. Try it. See how it goes. You know, it's not, uh, I'm not, you know, trying to talk you out of doing tracing. But, you know, do so carefully in, in realizing that you may end up with uh, a data headache as, as opposed to a performance headache, you know, in that case. But um, what this, this example is showing is, is tasks versus time. And uh, the, the coloration here is just, you know, what I think of as sort of the, the universal cartoon for a scientific code, which is that you do some flops, you do an exchange or a communication of some sort, and then you do a synchronization. And you could have uh, I.O. in there as well, but you know, let's call that an exchange with disk or something like that. And the key thing is then you repeat. Scientific codes, by and large, are wonderfully boring in that way. You know, they, they almost all have an outer loop. You know, so it's different than uh, transaction processing or something where you're reacting to new phenomenon as they come along. Most simulation codes, it may be a very detailed, complicated loop that knows everything about how stars explode, but it is a loop, and it's going to run over and over again. So this is, is a, a, an example of a code uh, whose performance degrades over time. And so if you want to be burning the CPUs and making progress uh, in that way, uh, then you want to spend time in the orange space doing flops. Um, Communication is spent um, in the blue, and synchronization, in this case it's a barrier, it says no task will leave uh, this point until everyone has entered it, right, uh, are the green. And so you can see that, that the, the, the orange columns line up very cleanly on the right-hand side of a synchronization. They're rather ragged on the left-hand side, and that's because not everybody's reaching the barrier, not, not all tasks are reaching the barrier at the same time. And uh, this is, is, a, is a useful example for, for tracing uh, for the following reason, which is that if you were to integrate this over time and just collapse that down, it might look very flat. And as we were saying before, flat is good. You know? And so you might say, well, where is this performance loss coming from? In this case, the performance loss is dynamic from iteration to iteration. And so there's something about the, the load balance in this code that's kind of getting off over time uh, and, and really has shown up almost exclu exclusively through tracing. So here's, here's some kind of general advice about, uh, you know, approaches that work. Uh, you know, I gave you a little bit of caution about tracing, but if you can develop a few techniques that are portable across the different sort of dimensions of performance that we talked about before, um, then that's great. You'll be able to use those as, as tools across a lot of different projects. Uh, you know, ven vendor-specific tools um, can lock you into architectural aspects of a particular machine. Uh, which is great. Uh, I'm, I'm somebody who learned a lot about the Spark architecture, and uh, uh, you know that was great at the time that, that I learned that, but now it's not as useful as, as it used to be. So, so this is another selling point for Pappy, right, is that Pappy is uh, architecture neutral. Um, what you learn about Pappy, you'll be able to carry to, to other architectures. Um, and yeah, use printf a little bit, you know. How, it might not hurt. Okay. So that's, a, that's about tools. Uh, you've you know, run your code with a performance tool, you get some numbers. What are we going to do with those? Uh, there's a little bit of terminology here that we need to get into first about speed ups and efficiency. And uh, these are uh, a little bit you know, beguilingly simple terms that everybody knows what efficient is and everybody knows what speed up is. Well, uh, not, not really. <laughs> so if you're reading papers uh, about uh, simulation codes, you know, these, these are a couple to really look at. So the, the speed up, you know, is the, seri the serial time. How long does it take you on one core? 
uh, you know, versus the parallel time as a function of n. So we'll be looking at some examples that look at how does the speed up change uh, as a function of concurrency. So n is cores, s is serial, and, and p is parallel. Um, well, not all codes are serial. And so how do we define the speed up for a code that is inherently parallel, run in a baby version compared to run in a big version? Well, you know, in some sense you might just approximate you know, uh, the, the serial version as the, the one node version or the, the smallest version that you can. Uh, but uh, where these are leading to is this, this concept of ISO efficiency. So in the space of uh, concurrency and problem sizes, uh, there are sometimes contours that, that define a space which is ISO efficient. And those can be good to know because if your your own uh, you know judgment says that you only want to run when you're seventy percent efficient or more, well, the ISO efficiency contour will tell you exactly how many cores to use for what type of problem. And yeah, if there are questions, please uh, let me know. Um, speed ups, uh, parallel speed ups are uh, you know probably the most one of the more gratifying uh, you know performance numbers that are out there. It tells you you know how much faster did you go than you would have if you had not used a big computer. Um, and this is looking at a dot product, a simple you know, uh, uh, you know, product of a vector with itself. Uh, the x-axis is the log of the, the size of the vector, the length of the vector. And the, uh, the x-axis, is, or the y-axis is the speed up. And there's a variety of colors here, but they go from you know, down here being flat to, you know, to up there. And that's from one to 16 cores on a single node. And uh, so, you know, there, there is regular structure here. Uh, and, you know, how can we interpret the structure? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to make really small problems efficient because you don't have prefetch, you don't have, you know, uh, cache line efficiencies and things like that. Um, as problems get big enough, they get asymptotically, uh, you know, uh, their, their performance converges asymptotically. But there's this weird bump in the middle. Um, and what's particularly weird about it is that on 16 cores, you get a speed up of 23. And so that, that seems pretty, pretty sweet, um, you know, that you could use 16 processors instead of one and get a speed up of 23. Such things are, are possible. And, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're fun if you can catch them. They're instructive in any case. Uh, in this case, uh, who can guess what the, uh, the L2 cache size for this machine is? So the, the maximum is, uh, and this curve is right around, I would say, 32 or so megabytes. So what that says is that this, this bump in the middle is a super linear, super linear speed up uh, from cache reuse. So much like in the, the sort of pyramid that we were looking at before in terms of the hierarchy of, of performance, um, if you can choose a problem size that fits just perfectly into cache, well, you've now avoided memory, main memory altogether. And uh, in, in such cases, the, the relative speed up that you can achieve can actually be super linear. But don't count on it. So. so that was an example of a scaling study. Yes? Mm-hmm. Uh, not all the caches are accessible to all the cores. Um, so uh, in this particular case, I think there are four L2 caches and four cores per cache. Um, and uh, the threads are not pinned to the cores, and so they're drifting around a bit in there. Uh, but yeah, good, thing. great question. I think any time I see a super linear speed up, I, I immediately become very suspicious and, and ask those sorts of why questions. So that was a scaling study. Uh, scaling studies, roughly speaking, come in two types. There's strong scaling and weak scaling. Uh, and you don't always get to choose what you're going to do. Um, if your assignment as a grad student is to solve a problem of a size at a resolution, then um, you're probably going to be doing a strong scaling study. With fixed problem size, you're allowed to adjust the concurrency. In a weak scaling uh, uh, regime, you, you have flexibility as to the problem size. And so problem size and... Uh, and concurrency are both, uh, you know, 
selectable uh, parameters in, in that. Much like in the dot product example that we looked at before is that by, by choosing the right problem size on the right concurrency, you can get uh, optimal performance. So this is a little bit harder. A dot product is way, way too simple for you guys. Um, this is the sharks and fish uh, code. If, you, if you've never heard of sharks and fish before, it's just uh, Newtonian dynamics. Let's, you know, let's leave it at that, is that you have, you have points that are moving around. Some are sharks, some are fish. They you know, at attract each other in certain ways under Newton's laws of equation. They have uh, you know, uh, uh, sources and sinks where they, you know, their, their densities increase and decrease and things like that. Um, and uh, as a particle problem, you have uh, this, this n-squared problem of figuring out what is the interaction of this particle with all the other ones that are there? And if you take CS267, you do a lot of examples of this uh, in different computer programming languages, different methodologies. There's some very, this is the, the simplest sort of, you know, two for loop approach. There, there are a lot of other approaches too that are algorithmically quite interesting. So as you, uh, you know, change the number of fish and change the, the number of, uh, uh, of processors that you throw at the problem, uh, you know, you see anywhere from, you know, a 2x speed up to, you know, a, a 24x speed up. So no super linear, you know, speed up in this case, but using 32 tasks, you get a 25-way uh, speed up. Not too bad in a lot of cases. Uh, that type of speed up is realizable for a very big problem in, in ways that it's not for a smaller problem. And so the type of speed up that you're able to achieve is, is definitely problem dependent. And the best way to run really is set by the constraints of what it is that you want to simulate. You know, if you're not interested in uh, a thousand fish, then don't run with a thousand fish. You know, that's that's uh, that's a hard constraint. If you are, then you're in that weak scaling regime, and you can adjust both together. So if you do that, uh, this is just a sort of example of how I did that scaling study, which is, you know, you uh, you'll probably have to run a lot of uh, of examples that that you can, and so. This is the number of fish on the x-axis, the time in seconds. Every red dot is, is one run that, that happened. Um, and if you throw all those up on a, on a uh, you know, GNU plot window or whatever, uh, an important first step is just to say, do these make sense? Do I see the right sort of trend and scaling? Are there outliers? Um, it's not unusual to see very uh, wild outliers from performance data. If there's contention uh, from another application on the machine, and from that, you can compute the ISO efficiency contours. So everything, you know, in terms of uh, how big a computer and uh, how big a problem is about 90% efficient along this somewhat jagged contour. And you can see the other contours there. So if you have a criterion for what's acceptable in terms of when you want to stop performance debugging, then you can pick it out uh, on an ISO efficiency contour and... Uh, and that, that's then a rule for uh, how, to, how to get good performance from that code. Um, this is, is kind of using that same problem taken to some uh, much uh, longer lengths. Uh, so it's, it's looking at uh, the percentage communication uh, as a function of the number of cores. So this is from one core to a, a thousand cores. And you can see that if you run a, a thousand fish uh, you know, simulation, on uh, 512 cores, you could spend 80% of your time just communicating. And uh, so that, that's an example of that, uh, the kind of performance catastrophe sort of thing within, uh, that, that can happen at scale with parallel computing. Okay, so those are some simple uh, pedagogical examples. Um, the, uh, the, the other examples that I wanna get into before we wrap up is, um, looking at how to do a scaling study in terms of how many performance measurements should you take. So this is a somewhat more complicated. It's a three-dimensional complex FFT. Uh, again, X is the, is the function of size. So it's an N cubed problem, N by N by N, uh, where N here goes from 100 to 1,000. Uh, and the, the figure of merit on the y-axis is megaflops per second. So you, you might you know, look at this type of, of uh, scaling study and say, OK, I have these data points along here. and, and uh, you know, as I increase the problem size, I see, uh, you know, higher and higher performance uh, overall. This is the same scaling study done with a lot of points. And this is probably way, way more points than you would do for ordinary scaling study. But if it's cheap, hey, why not, uh, you know, see how it goes. 
Uh, and what you can see is that across different concurrencies from 16 to 1024, the landscape of performance is actually very, very wild. You know, this is the same data we were looking at before, just you know, sampled in a more detailed way. And in particular, you can see that you, you drop tremendously in performance over a tiny range uh, right here. And um, the, uh, the motivation for that is, uh, is as follows, is that the, the uh, three-dimensional FFT works on the, the prime number factorization of n, right? So if you pick, if you vary n by a very small amount, you can change its prime factors tremendously. So the difference between doing a 2048 uh, cubed uh, FFT and doing a 2049 cubed FFT could be, you know, three years of magnitude or, or, or very, very large. Uh, so some of, the, some of the factors that lead to a, a, a performance landscape that is harder to optimize in are uh, the complexity in the algorithm, uh, the, the network that you're communicating over may switch based on uh, the, the type of communication that you're doing, contention, or, or bugs. So that's, a, that's probably the most complicated scaling, scaling study that I'll present. The, uh, th this is an example of a much simpler one, which is uh, looking at number of threads and runtime per second for a Jacobi, uh, uh, Jacobi iteration in, in OpenMP. And what you can see is that the, uh, the OpenMP overhead, in this case, actually, you know, as a, as a function of runtime, is, is decreasing. So a scaling study that, that's simple in, your, uh, in, a, in a linear or exponential way, and you have enough data that you really believe that you're sampling the whole thing, should look something like this. I'm going to skip the next one because I see I'm running out of time. Uh, so the most critical thing in terms of, like, staff that, that, that work on, uh, on other people's codes trying to improve them is load balance or load imbalance. And that is that as you go towards larger and larger parallelism, uh, ensuring that every task, every core, every node uh, has the same amount of work allotted to it uh, can be quite tricky. And so in this case, we have different MPI calls. The red is MPI weight all, the green is barrier, and the blue is MPI I send. So some of these tasks spend uh, considerably more time in the wait all. If you spend more time in the wait all, that probably means that you're waiting on some other task to send something to you. So you can have a very bumpy uh, landscape in this way. And it just gets worse with scale. So this is uh, an example, a similar example running on 1,024, same code. Um, and this step right here uh, is caused not by uh, these tasks somehow being faster at MPI wait all, it's actually all the rest of those tasks being uh, slower to arrive at, at the wait all. So at 64 tasks, you have about 200 seconds. At 960 tasks, uh, you know, you have about 230 seconds. And it can really come up in a lot of ways. This is an even bigger example on 16,000 cores. Um, and you know, there's a lot of lot of detail in this, but the, the most critical detail is, is it flat or is it not, right? And in this case, it's not flat. There's a certain set of tasks that have a different communication profile, performance profile overall. So the route towards doing the performance debug on this is probably to say, what's different about those tasks compared to the other ones? To resolve load imbalance, this is is a cartoon sort of demonstrating how load imbalance is resolved. The unbalanced uh, app that, that is running up there, again, this sort of universal scientific code that runs in a loop, uh, when it's balanced, can be restructured. Uh, it's the same area in terms of uh, work, uh, but is restructured in order to save the, the, the yellow time that, that's there overall. Um, how, does, how does load imbalance creep into codes? A lot of different ways, but, but one, uh, uh, I guess, two, uh, two aspects here. Um, Domain decomposition. If you have a big problem and you're using a parallel computer, you're probably going to be asked to divide your problem up into smaller chunks. And uh, the degree to which you're able to do that in a uniform way that is dynamically uniform over the, the run uh, of the code uh, will influence that. And uh, you can also have a lot of uh, quirks in multi-core that, that can lead to this as well. So this is an example of a domain. Uh, it's decomposition. It's the, NERSC, the old NERSC logo. Uh, decomposed into uh, colorful dots uh, on, on the right-hand side. 
there are algorithms that'll do this for you wonderfully, that, that will take a complex problem, uh, divide it up into the same size chunks. And in this case, uh, it's, it's a trickier one because it's not just same size, you also want same size and locality. So you're looking for patches of things that are the same size as other patches, but that are contiguous uh, next to one another. Um, I thought I would throw in at least one uh, uh, simple example here too, which is uh, people here have used MPI? A little bit? Okay. So th there is a call in, in MPI which everyone uses pretty much, that's MPI com rank. And most, you wouldn't think of it as a performance bottleneck in, in a lot of cases, but this is, this is a real world example where, where it is. And uh, MPI com rank does something really simple. It tells you which rank you are. Am I the, the zeroth one or am I the hundredth one? Um, and so in this case, the amount of communication time that's being spent by MPI com rank you know, is, is uh, quite significant. It's about 21% of, of the total communication time, about 6% of the wall clock time is spent calling MPI com rank. Well, if you're calling a communication subroutine like MPI com rank deep down in a function, uh, or let's say in a function that then gets called deep down inside a nested loop, um, you know, maybe the compiler will come in and, and save the day and, and uh, kind of work that, that routine out, but by and large it won't. And so uh, one of the reasons to use tools and to do uh, performance profiling for, for performance debugging is to be able to look at a profile and to say, where is the time going? Uh, so that's that's the simplest one. I hope you all avoid it. I would just say that uh, if you if you manage to end up in this sort of performance debug scenario, you're not the first person at all. Switching to the other extreme, the the uh, least uh, simple, uh, most interesting sort of performance debug I think has to do with graph theory and um, and communication topology. So these are which ranks are communicating with with which other ranks. Um, the algorithms that are behind these codes are kind of manifest in the in these uh, adjacency matrices. Uh, you know about stencils for milk. You can see all to all in the case of Paratech. Um, you know some uh, very tightly clustered uh, multi-core optimizations for impact. Uh, GTC is a toroidal code, so it looks like a. Oh, thank you. It looks like a, a simple line, and then uh, CAM is a polar. Uh, CAM is a uh, is a climate code, so it's simulating a sphere in three dimensions here, mapped into two dimensions. You can see that laid out too. So, painting performance data on on top of this is then possible. Um, so this is is uh, was not obvious to me when I first saw it, but. If you see a, a communication pattern that looks like this, this is a representation of a two-dimensional sphere uh, embedded in three, or, I'm sorry, a uh, two-dimensional surface, you know, in, in three dimensions that's, that's uh, spherical. So this is which ranks communicate which, with which other ranks. That is a, uh, a graph embedding of, of that adjacency matrix. And what you can see is you can paint onto this by color where is there more time spent communicating and less time spent communicating? So in the surface of a sphere, um, let's see, there's a, there's a communication bottleneck that seems to be originating here and that has impacts that, that go out to here. It's certainly a, a lot more interesting to look at than pie charts as well. Um, and th there's great software for doing this now in terms of doing graph layout. So if you end up with uh, you're running on 150,000 cores, you have 150,000 numbers, just realize, you know, looking at them in Excel may not be the, the best way to get to the answer. You know, if, if you can look at the adjacency of the communication, you can build a model of the, that communication pattern. Uh, there are some other slides uh, that I won't be able to get into here, but hopefully you can, uh, they're on the, the website that you can get at. They have to do with... Uh, Things like how to run how to run well in batch queues, um, and oh, and that's it. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah.
I, uh, I find performance debugging and other things like that interesting because I, I like to think of it like detective work, you know. So that's a clue, um, and what you do with a clue, you know, is, is probably go look uh, more closely. Um, in that particular problem, I, I don't know what the, the root cause was, but uh, let me give you uh, an example of one which is, is dreadfully common, uh, which is more about, uh, you know, regular uh, or orthogonal volumes. And so uh, if you take a problem and you divide it up into, into squares or rectangles or things like that, um, what happens on the surface can be a different communication uh, pattern than what happens on the interior. What happens on an edge can be different than what happens on a surface, and what happens at a corner can be different from, from those as well. And so that has to do with, uh, it, it'll come out in how you program it, but what does every point need to do uh, in order to make it to the next cycle through the, the program. And if any of those any of those categories of parts in the domain uh, have a different amount of work than, than the others do, then you can end up with a load imbalance. That's uh, definitely what caused that stair-steppy sort of one that I showed that was like that before. And so, um, you know, look at the domain decomposition. Um, look at how many things it is. So there's a difference between having one task that is obliterating the performance of the rest of them and having a cluster of a certain number. So um, another very common sort of uh, performance debug situation is where everybody's doing okay except for, uh, or no, rank zero is doing okay and everybody else seems to have some sort of problem, right? And so almost without fail in that situation, what the problem is is somebody said, there's something I need to do but only on one thread, right? And so they say, well, which thread should I pick? I'm going to pick on thread zero. And I'll say, well, if I'm thread zero, then go out and do this check. Well, everybody else tears right past that, that block of work that, that thread zero has to do. Um, and thread zero is then late to getting to the synchronization point, and so you have a, a load imbalance as a result of that. So you know, looking at the, the number and type of those performance discontinuities is important. All right, thank you very much.